is always a target area um, to keep us down. Um, and we mentioned military recruitment. I mean, what, what can you say about that one, Ian? Well, it's been um, um, almost, let's say, that it's been deliberate strategy for certainly, I mean, I can remember in my, uh, in my youth um, that uh, you know, areas like South Wales, um, Merseyside, yeah. the uh, northeast of England, and Glasgow, these areas are deliberately maintained with employment opportunities below the level of population. So, uh, or below the level of uh, population um, at working age. And, and the reason for that is, is very deliberate, and that's to maintain your military strength. And it shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody listening to this show that 60% of all military recruitment, particularly in the, um, the army and, and ostensibly the infantry regiments, who are all called the rifles now, for, and we can touch on that in a second as well. But um, yeah. it, they come. 60% of the uh, recruits come from those four areas of the country. And uh, I mean, obviously, if full employment was available in these areas, then uh, you know, probably that would be the uh, the first option exactly. for for many of the people that do end up going into the military. And, and, of course, what we've got now is we've got this illusion that they're joining the British Army, and actually they're joining nothing of the sort. Uh, and we saw this with the, um, um, the decommissioning of the colours of many of these regiments who had uh, you know, r- quite a tremendous uh, military history. Um, and they, the regiments have been decommissioned, and they are, have all been merged into this nondescript, the Rifles, and, and this is the next stage in terms of um, completely uh, effect, wiping out the effectiveness of the British military. And where we're heading, of course, is to the EU military. And the game plan is that effectively there will be an EU uh, military versus each of the uh, 27 nations having their own military sometime in the next um, 12 years. The game plan is, is to achieve a unified EU military at the absolute outside by 2021. Now, if they can accelerate the agenda by creating some massive external threat, then, of course, they will do so. But Mm -hmm. that's the uh, the sort of timescales that they're working towards. And so what you'll see is the process of gradualism being applied. You'll see more and more exchanges with foreign military. You'll see more and more sort of foreign... Uh, other European, by this I mean other European nations, military on European soil. Yeah. And, and ultimately what's going to be very interesting to see is what, what the relationship is between the EU military and the um, US servicemen that are on the soil. Because over the same period, um, there is the, object- of the objective to, of course, completely um, disenfranchise the United States of America and merge the U.S. into the North American Union with Canada and Mexico. Yeah. And one of the primary objectives of that, apart from creating the, uh, the unified currency of the Amero, the part of the objective is to uh, facilitate Mexicans being eligible to serve in the U.S., what is today, the U.S. military. Exactly. Because, <clears throat> I mean, that's part of the agenda with the, the, regional, the regional armies. If you... If you're in, say, I don't know, say, say we've got um, a, a British force that are up in, I mean, well, you, know, you could even look at Bosnia if you wanted to choose somewhere where we previously destroyed, but you, you're less inclined to, to avoid shooting people who don't speak your language. Exactly, exactly. So what they want to achieve is a situation where the, whenever there is any civil unrest, for whatever reason, that the troops on the streets who are um, quelling the unrest do not speak the same language. So you, you, you effectively uh, take away any possibility of empathy between the troops and the, uh, yeah, and the civil population. Yeah, um, Jim just reminded me, thanks for that one, Jim. Um, the, the questionnaire, the, the, the army personnel that were asked, you know, would you open fire on UK citizens if, if, if necessary? Um, obviously would determine what type of role or what what entry would appear on this personnel's uh, database file. 
to determine where they would serve in the future. So I exactly. that one myself personally I've I've not looked into that one but I've seen a lot of other researchers talk about the the question. So well, you know, I mean, another part of the agenda, you see, beyond the establishment of the, or the EU is established, but beyond the establishment of the uh, North American Union, the next stage of the agenda is to merge the North American Union with the EU yeah. and, mm-hmm. and to form the North Atlantic Union. Absolutely. And, and the reason that this is uh, such an important target is because once you merge the North American Union with the North Atlantic Union, then you have... Uh, effectively a military stroke trade block of a billion people. That's it. And of course that then is a balance with, you know, the, uh, the Chinese and, um, exactly. and India. Uh, isn't it tra- transatlantic uh, trade agreements already in place yeah. between the US Absolutely. and the EU? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look at NATO as a framework, uh, the, N- the North Atlantic Trade Organization, they've already got a, a framework to copy there. You don't you don't see too many people kicking off about NATO or, or about UN troops. People just think it's great. Yeah, oh yeah, these these guys is like a a group of powerful um, countries who you know dedicate some of their troops to help the worst places in the world. Well, there's obviously the other side of the coin as well, but it, it just seems to be heading closer to to what you see in um, in some George Orwell material. You know, you've got sort of <laughs> just massive global different different you know yeah. stuff with four merge the two and it's just one against the other and you could just, and, just you know, we, we, all the other. It, it, it's a it's just a game of chess and i mean this is the problem you know where we're at is we have uh we have um uh allowed permitted this this ruling elite these socio psychopaths who are not human and i don't mean that in any other sense than you know fundamentally what defines humanity is the ability to um, be able to express emotion, yeah. particularly love and compassion and empathy. And, you know, we, we see in the likes. I mean, Tony Blair was the consummate socio-psychopath. Absolutely. Uh, it, I mean, he, he, you know, in, the, in the, uh, the German concentration camps, he would have been the classic capo, True. you know, the, the, the guy who is appointed to keep control over his fellow prisoners um, and, you know, is awarded the uh, better food rations or better clothing or whatever than, than the rest. Yeah. And, and, and Tony Blair, of course, fits that bill. I mean, he's a clinical socio-psychopath. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and of course, uh, you know, it doesn't matter really where we go. We see that the vast majority of people, to varying degrees, display the same uh, symptoms. Too right. I mean, look at... Um I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a hard scenario to try and foresee what's going to happen next. And things always they're not as fast as we would like them to be. I don't say we would like them to be to for, for the agenda to speed up, but when we talk about these things, we talk about them in terms of years. And sometimes it, it ends up being decades before they come about. But it, it generally oh, yeah. always comes. So well, these guys these guys work in very long time scales. I mean, for reasons that I talk about again in the in my DVD, the Hidden Agenda. Yeah. I mean, th- these guys believe that uh, you know they they need to be pursuing towards an agenda in their lifetime, even though they may not see the results of that uh, their efforts um, reach fruition in their lifetime. And we really have to get into the same basic mindset, which is you know we can't necessarily expect to see changes come overnight. Um, but, you know, we need to be doing whatever we can to working towards what we wish to dream, if you like, as our future. And every now and again, we get an amazing piece of help which comes out of left field. I mean, a classic example of that is the release of the Climate Gate emails last year. Yeah. Because very few people realize how close we were to the basic framework of global governance being established at Copenhagen last year. Yeah, too right. I mean, the primary purpose of the Copenhagen conference was to establish the basic framework for global governance all around the fear of global warming. Exactly. And, and, of course, the, uh, the release of the Climate Gate emails, which have proven, despite the fact that you know, they've been exonerated um, by their peers, but, I mean, you, there's one, one document that's been written by a guy called uh, John Costella, 
and it's um, you can download it uh, from the website uh, www.assassinationscience.com uh, forward slash climate gate and on the, in that website you can see a report that Dr. John Costella has uh, put together he's a PhD physicist and it's it's the most comprehensive but at the same time readable it's about 157 or so pages um, and what he's done is he's done an analysis of the climate gate emails, yeah. and you can see just how politicized the whole climate agenda had been since the early 1990s. Yeah. And, of course, the release of those emails completely pulled the rug out from under the Copenhagen agreements. That's why you've heard nothing of Al Gore, you know, in the last year, and it's, it's why you've seen a little bit in the media, because they're trying to get the agenda back on track. But I think they know now that they're, they're pretty much sort of fighting a losing battle yeah. because the vast majority of people, you know, do not believe that um, um, you know, carbon dioxide is the uh, is the significant influence in the, in the climate. You know, there are many many other factors, and for to consider that man is influencing the climate to that degree is actually incredibly arrogant. If we are influencing the climate, we should take a closer look at HARP. Exactly. I see a lot of people that would um, instantly jump and, and, and claim that it's harp whenever there's a, a, an earthquake or a flood. However, um, I'm not going to rule it out at all. Pakistan and Russia, um, they are strange weather patterns. It does involve um, certain weather remaining in the same place for an un or, or an abnormal amount of time. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to listen to that opinion on that one I just don't I, I'm not I'm obviously I can't really make my mind up I'm, I'll accept it one day and cast it aside the next depend on what evidence there is but it's definitely some technology that's got some uh, massive global potential weather no, modification yeah. weather modification is a very interesting area uh, because in the west it's quite no no nonsense what are you on about you're off your head and then China and Russia have uh, public, uh, public bodies or, you know, that are in charge of weather modification the Chinese Weather mm -hmm. Modification uh, Bureau, you know, and their whole job is to control uh, weather over cities coming up to uh, certain economic times or there's having a parade or a, an event, you know. And then they think it's not going on in the West, even though it's just, it's ridiculous. Exactly. Um, so we can um, get on to some issues that we, we, we need to cover before we finish up. Um, something I need to remind you about, Ian, was your your meeting with the local MP. What what was all that about? Oh you know, yeah, well, that was interesting. It, it's the the first and uh, uh, probably not the last. It's the first time I've been to any kind of political meeting in the in the UK, and I, I went along because uh, a flyer had been put through my door, and it was the the new MP, and uh, you know, in my area uh, it's one of many where the MP, of course, replaced the long sitting MP due to the expenses scandal. Yeah. And uh, it was all about um, getting local people together to discuss ways of saving money. And, and I sat <laughs> through for about an hour and a half, you know, biting my tongue. Um, and eventually I, I, I just couldn't bear it any longer. And I just made the observation that, you know, what we were participating in here was completely outrageous because in the first instance, it was, you know, just very sad for me that many of the issues being talked about were being referred to a politician at national level. Yeah. Because, you know, most of the issues that were being discussed from the floor should have been the issues being discussed by local councils exactly. or, or the area council. You know, they, they, to bog national government down with some of this stuff is, is just outrageous. But anyway, the bottom line was I, I made the observation to the MP and I said, look, you know, for the sake of the discussion, there's been some very interesting proposals put forward this evening in terms of ideas that could be considered for saving a bit of money. But in the scheme of things, it's nickel and diming. Exactly. You know, it's like any, any business. It's all very well to rein in the horns, you know, when you know you're going through a little bit of a quiet spell in your business. But at the same time, when you do that, you've got to have a strategy. You've got to have a business strategy that's looking at how you're going to generate additional revenues. Mm 